All right, welcome everyone. Um, happy Ada Lovelace Day. How about that? Yeah. My name is Eric Paulos, and I'm uh, on the faculty here in EECS. I'm also one of the co-founders and the current director of the Citrus Invention Lab, which I hope you get a chance to look at later today. And I help lead the campus, uh, uh, the Berkeley campus lead for the Connected Communities Initiative that you heard about this morning. Um, I, I, everyone's aware of Ada Lovelace as one of the first computer programmers that she's really acknowledged as. But what you might not know is that she, uh, in her notes, actually emphasized at the time as a visionary the difference between the prevailing view of computing at the time, using the sort of analytical engine as just a calculating machine. And she envisioned its ability to be programmed to solve problems of sort of any complexity. And she realized the potential of the device extended far beyond the mere number crunching. She was actually the daughter of the poet Lord Byron, and sort of the humanist in this computer scientist ran deep. Um, and her mindset, she talked about the poetical science. And that led her to ask questions about the analytical engine of her time, examining how individuals and the society relate to technology as a collaborative tool. And I believe that many of the things that Dale has sort of his visions and his projects and the communities that he's enabled um, have really helped carry this spirit of openness, of access, of collaboration, and creativity, not just across the gender lines, but also across multiple disciplines as well. The way he's enabled and invited others to participate in the maker movement has truly been remarkable. Um, Dale has been a technology publicist enthusiast for a long time. He, Dale Doherty was founder of Make Magazine, which I'm sure all of you have on your bookshelves. It's certainly on my, in my lab all the time. And he also created the world's largest DIY festival, Maker Fair, which I'm sure many of you have been to. Um, in fact, uh, well over half a million people experienced a Maker Fair in 2013, and I can only imagine what it is now. I'm sure Dale will promptly correct me, but I know that even last year's Maker Fair here in the East, and, and sorry, in uh, uh, the Bay Area Maker Fair, over almost 150,000 people went to that single event. For those of you that somehow haven't gone, uh, there's actually even one this weekend, the East Bay Maker Fair this Sunday in Oakland, so you have plenty of time to get over there. Um, before that, uh, Dale's actually not sort of a recent arrival. He's been in this area for a long time. He co-founded O'Reilly Media, where he was editor of the, many of the trade books you're familiar with, and even the Global Network Navigator as far back as 1993. He identified and helped name the Web 2.0 movement. Um, and then he's recently spun out his own comp company, Maker Media, and he also makes his own wine. There's many things. So <laughs> perhaps Dale will help us envision what I'd like to sort of coin the, in, in honor of, sort of Ada Lovelace, the, the poetical making. So please help me in uh, welcoming Dale Doherty today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, I, I really, f I, I want to say in a good way, I feel like an outsider, um, uh, you know, outside of, of institutions and academia particularly. But um, I, I want to share with you some things that I think in the maker movement that, that in, in some ways uh, both surround places like uh, Berkeley, but also are coming inside, and in many ways have always been inside of institutions as well. But today, I want to kind of talk about sort of a simple thing of how making can change your mind. And, um, you know, my inspiration is Marvin Minsky's quote here, that much of the mind's power seems to stem from just the messy ways its agents cross-connect. And for me, the emphasis is on messy. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and I think, uh, in some ways, I'm not just talking about our minds, but our society, our culture, um, what I see at Maker Fair is a very messy thing, but it's creating lots of connections. And the connections happen in our own minds. Um, I think everybody sees something at a Maker Fair a little differently. But, you know, one of the most powerful experiences we can have, I think, is to take an idea and do something to make it real to give it life on its own. And, you know, that is, is a matter of uh, sometimes sketching, sometimes uh, shaping, sometimes, you know, building something. But to be able to, in a sense, take it out of our heads and put it out and be able to share it and talk with other people, that's essentially the act of creation that, that you know, we, we literally worship in our culture. But, but we kind of have simple ideas about it, 
And it really is kind of messy. It isn't just a moment. It is really a process. It's a practice. It's something we get better at doing. And I think one of the things that fascinates me about the maker movement is not just the thing that you're creating, but the thing you're self-creating, which is yourself, right? You're changing the world in a way by creating something new, but you're also changing yourself. You're changing your perceptions of what's possible for you to do and what is possible in terms of impact that you can have. And I think that's in a nutshell what I you know, would, would like to get across today, that, that I, I think this, you know, we can talk about invention, we can talk about you know, art and, and lots of things, but behind it really is something very personal, something that is about developing yourself. Um, and I think the, the, the real interesting part of it is you can't do it alone. It isn't just about you focusing on yourself. It's being a part of a community. It is, not, it is almost, I, I say this about Maker Faire, the, the genius of it in a way is that you're putting this thing between you and another person and you're talking about that thing, but you're really talking about yourself. You know, it, it's something that reveals you to someone else in a, in a conversation. And that's essentially what I wanted to do with Maker Faire, um, to, to make it easy for you to, to talk that way. And, and I think what we've kind of seen, and this in many ways what I'm really proud about the Maker Movement isn't the things, and I'll show you a bunch of those things and, and we'll have a good time looking at them, but it's almost this mindset that I think is shared and not just by a few people in the Bay Area or at one event or another, but I traveled to lots of maker fairs around the world. I'll, I'll get into that. But I think it underpins all of uh, the community, um, a sense of agency, that I can do things, that it matters, uh, engaged, playful. I, I, uh, I really believe one of the keys to making is this, it's a really high level of engagement. Your mind, your body, what you're doing, you, you fall into it, and, and the sense of play. And, and I, I'm gonna talk about education in a little while, but I really, when I started the magazine, I had this sense that I wanted it to be about play for adults. I wouldn't call it that, it wouldn't t nobody would take me seriously. But what I saw is that I think innovation arises from a state of play. Not from, a state, not from intention so much, but from getting together and trying things, experimenting, not worrying about whether you fail or not or whether you have the right answer. You just try it and then move on. And being resourceful and resilient, um, learning how to do things with constraints. Um, I think one of the interesting things about makers, um, even though in America we have you know, a culture of abundance here, most of them work without particular funding or particular um, uh, large amounts of dollars and, and they kind of make it work. Interdisciplinary, people cross disciplines or don't care whether they're an amateur in an area. They still try and, and, and at the same time, I think there's a, a, it actually is a way of revaluing expertise because you appreciate experts, but it doesn't intimidate you. It doesn't keep you out of it. And then this sort of notion of which I believe we inherited in a sense from the open source movement of just, you know, the default is sharing. Uh, rather, if you look at inventors in the past, to some degree to be secretive, protective, proprietary was the default. And today it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna see what happens when I share it. So I started this magazine about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. And uh, you know, in many ways it was a reinvention of popular science, popular mechanics. Uh, but my original intent was that I was doing some books and other things on hacking, and I had the idea that we would begin hacking the physical world, not just software. That the applications of the future wouldn't just be on a computer terminal, they'd be all around us and everywhere. They'd be on our bodies, they'd be in our cars, they'd be in our homes. And that was an exciting new world of, of technology that we hadn't, you know, I, I didn't even know what it w would be necessarily. But I, when I went back to those older magazines, I said that, that, that was, they had an orientation to the world around them, which was that you could do anything. And I thought hackers had that same mindset. You know, just figure it out and, and do it. Again, popular mechanics might have been about hacking pig troughs uh, as opposed to um, things that we have around us today. 
But I, I first use maker there um, really to kind of separate makers from consumers. And, and I think a lot of what I'm trying to get across is to get people to see themselves as producers, creators, shapers, builders, not just buyers, not just to accept what we get. And certainly if we're going to talk about the future, we have to be engaged in creating it. It's not something we just go and find and buy. So Maker Faire grew out of the magazine, and like I said, I, I really wanted to create a, a more sophisticated form, but maybe not so sophisticated, of show and tell. It's something you do in kindergarten, but you put your project on the table. It's how science fairs and craft fairs and art fairs and county fairs all work. And, and, but make it fun, make it enjoyable. And I, I think, uh, again, behind that is I wanted lots of people to participate. I wanted, I believed as I started finding makers that they existed all around us in our community, but we didn't get to know them. They do a lot of their work in private, like on a kitchen table or in a garage. And I wanted to flush them out. I wanted to see where they were, who they were, and learn more about them. We celebrated our 10th year in the Bay Area this year, so we've been doing maker fairs for 10 years. And I think that's, I'm, I'm kind of proud that we've managed to sustain it even that long. But, um, uh, we have also expanded it. Um, Eric mentioned this. We'll probably have a mil over a million people go to a Maker Faire this year. Um, you know, I'm going from here tonight to Rome, uh, which is our third, uh, third annual Maker Faire in Rome. Last weekend we had uh, Maker Faire in Pittsburgh and uh, Istanbul and Seoul, Korea. So they're, they're, they really are extending beyond certainly the Bay Area and out, out into the world in a lot of exciting ways. This was our Maker Faire in New York just about three weekends ago. And, you know, uh, again, what I kind of like here is what category is, is a cardboard dinosaur puppet and three men on stilts playing music? Um, and the fact that they're working together. Um, you know, and that just happens at a Maker Faire. That's not staged. Just they meet each other and the dinosaur starts dancing to the music and people waiting in line are entertained and want to be part of it. You know, we have a 3D printed robot and a robot made out of, uh, you know, uh, recycled steel and, and things from a junkyard in, in Denver. We have interactive art where you, you know, you touch it and it changes color. Um, we have, you know, duct tape rat robot, I guess you might call it that. But uh, I, one of the things I really love about the Bay Area is a lot of things just sh show up and they're running along the ground, they're mobile. I don't know where they came from and who they belong to, but, uh, you know, it's just... That's, it's wonderful, it's improv. Um, you know, we have a fashion show and uh, really um, looking at wearables, looking at design. And one of the things I was really proud of this fashion show in the Bay Area is, while uh, I'm not a fashion forward person myself, um, it was really an attempt to hack the fashion show, to make it different, to not just be about, you know, uh, slender models in, um, in, in new things, but to show, you know, differently abled people, like in this one. These are women wearing prosthetics as fashion statements, not just as functional things. And so to see them come out and walk the runway and be celebrated and applauded really changes your idea of what a fashion show can be. But there's just lots of interactions with, uh, with things, um, and, and uh, I think it's one of the elements that ties this all together is people do get a, an opportunity to interact with things, do things that uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but uh, it looks fun. But a lot of what I'm trying to promote in many ways is hands-on engagement, doing things, and almost just to break down the barriers. I don't care whether you see yourself as an engineer, a scientist, an artist, or any of these things. Just try things and let that come to you and, and you enjoy it. This is a project based on Makey Makey where you're using fruit as a computer interface to play like a keyboard. Um, and uh, it, is, it changes the relationship of you to that technology, I think, to do that. You know, craft is there. And then I love this kind of crowd scene, people just sitting there, tired after, uh, maybe overwhelmed a bit by all that's going on at Maker Fair. But we have our electric muffins who are obviously taking a rest as well. Um, a sculpture made out of locks, uh, and he's dragging a big key behind him. 
Um, we have things that have been to Burning Man, like this rhinoceros uh, that shoots fire at various orifices. And, uh, you know, um, and then just these, these moments of interactions of people and robots, to use your term here. Um, you know, how do I build them? How do I control them? What do they do? And, and everybody seems to be pretty fascinated by that. Of course, we have people walking around again. I don't know where he came from, but he had his own par robotic parrot. And uh, then the 3D printed robot and the electric giraffe um, have their moment as well. Um, we have steampunk and, and, and more sort of creative uh, work. And I, I always like this picture because this is why I do it, is to see that expression on kids' faces of looking at things and eyes wide open. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think they see this in media. I don't think they see this in school. I don't think they see it at home very much. But these are real people building things, and, and they're passionate in, 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 you know, doing these things. And they get to meet them and talk to them and, and, and learn more about them. My hope is they walk away saying, I want to do that. That's, that's who I am. And we have people like crafters show up, and this is a thing called yarn bombing, um, <laughs> which, uh, um, you know, they just put those eyes in trees. And the funny thing that... You know, I'd go around and, and I'd, I like this kind of humor and stuff and, and laugh. Hey, did you see this? And people would say no. And, and someone said to me, you know, that it's only kids that look up in trees and expect to see eyes. You know, <laughs> most of us adults don't bother looking up. So, you know, uh, this is just from last weekend in Pittsburgh. And I, um, it kind of captures a, a spirograph powered by a scooter, you know. It's just, just wonderful. And I talked to the man uh, who built that. And he said, well, I was at the Bay Area Fair. And I saw it there, and I talked to the guy who did that, and I made one of my own for our fair. So things, things move along. And this was in Tokyo, and a uh, fellow that, uh, you know, make, you know projecting you know, images out of the song uh, while he's playing the piano. And I asked him earlier, he said, you know, I'm not a very good musician. I thought I needed something else to make a performance. <laughs> But, uh, and this was in San Diego about a, a week ago. Um, you know, and I'm not exactly sure what it is, but uh, I'm not standing around there and people come on and say, oh, that's so cool, you know? <laughs> like, and it's uh, pneumatically driven and, um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's the stuff we do. <laughs> um, Maker Fairs early in this year in Cairo for the first time in an Arabic speaking country. Um, we, uh, and uh, Shenzhen was a really large share. The Chinese governments uh, really made making a priority, both for reasons of like small business formation, but also I think they get that they kind of have the large factories, the large men, they have the capacity to do things. They don't necessarily have the capacity to create new things for them to do, and that's kind of, I think, Maker Faire represents that to them. That's the largest makey robot we've ever had. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, but I, I think this theme here of, of getting people to see themselves as producers, as, as innovation being almost a participatory sport, that you're involved. That's my goal, is I can imagine a world where we have a bunch of smart people that make all the decisions for everybody else. And I can imagine a world in which we all feel like we're engaged in that, and we're building technology to solve problems, and we're doing things that make our world a better place, and we feel invested in that not isolated or outside of it. We see in a, you know, making as a, a form of innovation, digital fabrication, cheap electronics. Most of you probably know this, um, you know, uh, but I, I think it, 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 it almost it's becoming so well known that I find myself wanting to make sure we don't just define the maker movement as like a um, seed bed for startups. Um, it's, it's more than that. And, and yet I think it's important in some ways, we've, we've brought hardware back into the conversation, and companies are beginning to rethink that and even venture capital. But I, what I care about most is education. I think the maker movement has the potential to transform learning and in our communities. Yes, in schools, but even at home, even in communities as, as well. I think we're bringing back, in some ways, John Dewey's philosophy of learn by doing, of uh, getting kids to use their hands and tie this. And this is another element of changing your mind. I think, you know, shop classes were banned or dropped. Nobody cared. Parents didn't rise up and said, my kid needs to take shop class. In fact, the opposite 
mindset was there is we don't really need shop class anymore. Uh, that's if my son or daughter were going to be a trade school, uh, go to trade school, that would be appropriate for them. But I think we see maker spaces coming into schools and libraries um, and, and even universities um, really with a different mindset. It's almost taking the computer lab, which is a pretty dreary place if it still exists, um, you know, with a row of, of computers, combining with an art studio, shop class, having machines, and really the idea, I said originally, of taking ideas and, and making something, and be able to talk about those ideas, tell a story about those ideas. Um, you know, a, a number of things, uh, you know, what, um, you know, the exciting thing for me is this is, this is coming as a groundswell. It's happening from the bottom up. It's not coming from the Department of Education. It's not, um, you know, some of their programs like STEM and Common Core. Eh, good luck to them. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with them, but it's sort of like a restaurant where the food's good but the service is bad. The, the you know, it's the way they're being moved into the school system that, that makes um, teachers r rebel against them and, and, and parents. But making is coming in a different route, and I'm really pleased to see so many champions begin to recognize that it's not about what they know, it's about what they can do, and, and really enabling kids to, to, to learn more, to do things. So there's kind of a maker shift that I, I won't go over in a lot here, but I think one of the things I saw, you know, information technology, how do we have more about experience technology? What, is, what would that mean? Um, uh, because I think, uh, I think school, for instance, wants to be more about creating the context, the experience in which you're learning and meeting other people and doing this. That, that kind of lab experience, I think, is, is really terribly important. And, and in many ways, at our, our lower levels of education, it's been eradicated. Um, and, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about making that we've seen is <laughs> everybody wants to do it. It's not hard. You don't need an extrinsic motivational system. You don't need other incentives. The thing itself is satisfying and rewarding, and kids um, get, get into that there. This is a, a phrase from uh, Eric Raymond, who was asked, why do people spend all their time you know, developing free software, developing software they won't make any money at? And he said, well, they're scratching their own itch. And I think that's behind a lot of the maker community, a lot of those pictures I show you. You know, they had an idea, and they wanted to express that idea, and getting it out to a community and sharing it was, was really the, the, the key driver for that. But we see things. This is Mary. I met her at, at Seattle Maker Fair, and you can't quite see, but she's sitting in a wheelchair. And she told me that she didn't like her wheelchair. She was unhappy with it. And she wanted to be able to do some of the things that she was able to do before she was confined to a wheelchair. And she said she went online and watched a video from Maker Fair. It was Carl Bass from Autodesk talking about CAD. And she set out to learn how to do CAD and ended up designing her own wheelchair, right? And then building a prototype. So what she really wanted to be able to do was build a wheelchair that could take her out on hiking trails because that's what she did before she had uh, been confined to a wheelchair. And so there's tremendous power for people, I think, here to realize uh, you know, their own dreams but be able to work with other people. She needed a lot of other help. She wasn't that technical in this end, but she can overcome that with society. And this isn't my quote, but it sort of, you know, kind of gets what I think this feeling is in the community that I would love, you know, and it's why I feel so passionate about sharing it with lots of people, students, adults, kids, because, you know, it really almost orients us to what do we believe about the future? And, you know, the autonomous, uh, Weapons is, is kind of one of those dark sides of the future. Um, and, and yet, I feel that if you go to a Maker Faire, you walk away feeling optimistic. You feel that there's a lot of creative talent. There's a lot of people combining and connecting in new ways to be able to do things that really matter. Um, our Maker Faire in New York is at the home of the New York World's Fair, which was in 1964 and actually 1939. And many people who come there, it resonates with them, and they say, you know, oh, I remember that as a kid. And, in, um, and we did a, a Diet Coke and Mentos fountains in front of us, and we really, you know, kind of gets to the idea here that Maker Faire is a celebration. But um, what was fascinating, when I came back, I was just doing some research, and 
Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, went to the 1960 Fair World's Fair, and he, um, 1964, and he wrote a piece about what he would expect to see 50 years from now. And, um, uh, and so it was 2014. And I, I won't go into the details, I, I want to work that up a little bit in more detail, but he said things like, um, we'll have robots, but they won't be any good. <laughs> you know, um, he said, uh, we'll have an unmanned uh, mission to the Mars, but it, uh, putting a man on Mars will still be a long way off. Really prescient things. Uh, he talked about autonomous vehicles. He said we'd only have, we'd have little cars running around, not, not real, real things. And at Maker Faire we had this Power Wheel racing series and they had two of the cars were autonomous that were racing in it. But he kind of said at the end that mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom. And, you know, the lucky few can be involved in creative work of any sort will be the true elite of mankind, for they alone will do more than serve a machine. And in some ways, you know, when people ask me why the maker movement, why today, and I think to some degree consumer culture has created something that is ultimately unsatisfying, that it is boring, and we're looking for something to express more of who we are, what we can do, and to have that sense of engagement and impact in our society. Thank you very much. A few questions? Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Yes, we have time for uh, maybe one or two questions. Um, Greg Niemeyer. Yeah, thank, I can't help notice that your beautiful talk followed Stuart Russell's talk, and about 95% of the technology is the same. So what gets us to choose an imagination that is so yeah. dark or an Im imagination that is so bright? And what are your thoughts about That's how many people point. from the Maker Fair end up at DARPA? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two answers to that. One is I did get a little bit involved with DARPA trying to create some maker spaces so, uh, for high school students. Uh, so, um, and... Uh, but you know, one of, one of the interesting things is for many, many bright kids that go into engineering, they're, you know, they're, that pathway to going into defense contractor stuff is really wide and, 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 and obvious. And what I think is happening because of things like the maker movement is that, um, that the kind of things you do as an engineer, a designer, can be done more independently. You don't necessarily need the large company and, and uh, you may not make you know, the same salary, you may not make things, but if your life choice is different than that, um, I see a lot of young people, even in China, um, one of the reasons um, uh, that I think this is so interesting there is we see you know, graduates from engineering programs becoming entrepreneurs and trying to create things that they believe will benefit the world and, and not just go take that large job in, in a factory. So it is at least an alternative path for more people, that they don't necessarily go to work for Boston Dynamics or uh, other, other people. But I see other people come out of there, even the, you know, um, the Megabots uh, team kind of has, has that background, and they're kind of making playful war robots, I guess is, is a way of saying that. Another question? One more. You talk about how uh, this, this making mentality can cultivate people to come like into a community that would transcend otherwise existing you know structures borders right. how can we activate a more latent community of inventors and makers in a region like the San Joaquin Valley which so badly needs some sort of development or catalyst yeah. great question is that Merced or is that yeah. yeah I've been down talking to your school board that's one way um, you know change the schools you know just give them more you know uh, just a, a quick thing, there's a great article written by Tom Wolf in like the 70s called The Tinkerings of Bob Noyce. And Bob Noyce was a co-founder of Intel. And he, the question that Wolf had was why did the, the giants of the information age not come from large cities? They came from small towns in middle America. Uh, Noyce came from Grinnell, Iowa. And his, his answer was, and Noyce's answer was, in a small town, we couldn't always get what we wanted. We had to make it. And I think if you apply that mentality of constraints, I, this is why I think the third world countries like India and, and others will do, outperform us in ways because they will be more creative with the things they have and make things as opposed to just going to the store and saying, well, it's on a shelf there. So uh, in some ways, the, you know, how do you take your weakness and make it into a strength is one of the questions there. Uh, 
But you know, Noyce was lucky to have transistors, uh, exposed to transistors while he was at Grinnell College. But he, you know, lucky to find a professor who knew something about that. But he was also grounded in doing things. And, and I think in these agricultural communities, uh, we see some things, uh, like ag tech and others beginning to explore, how can you have impact in your local community? Um, even like drones and stuff. Uh, I was at a conference recently, I never not heard this term, but it's a funny, you know, a new generation of internet, I mean, not internet service providers, but drone service providers that farmers won't want to fly their own drone, they'll hire someone who wants to do it for them, just like crop dusting, right? So there are new opportunities here, and I think we just have to dive in and explore that. Thank you. Join me once again in Thank thanking you. Dale for such an inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.